Every year, some police officers make career damaging mistakes, violate rights, and face massive lawsuits because of critical gaps in legal knowledge. And to do my best in helping to prevent that, I'm interviewing the CEO of Blue to Gold Legal Training, Anthony Bandiero. This is all very crucial, particularly if you want to work in law enforcement or you do work in law enforcement. Let's get right into the interview I had with Anthony. I want to start out with traffic stops, obviously a common thing in law enforcement. So what are common legal mistakes police officers make on traffic stops? First of all, thank you for having me on the show. I'm really, really glad to be here and to help, you know, kind of uh, teach our officers, you know, how to be safe out there. I, I actually say like legally safe. That's my job, right? Physically safe. You had other uh, great hosts on that can teach officers how to be physically safe. But my goal is legal safe. So I mean, traffic stops, I think that the main issue I see here is that there's there's something called a pretext traffic stop. And some observers uh, believe that pretext traffic stops is like some kind of four letter word. It's it's code for racial profiling. Clearly, racial, ethnicity, religion, national origin is highly illegal, unethical, immoral, and so forth. But a pretext traffic stop is essentially something that the Supreme Court has upheld where the cop may have a hunch, for example, that something else is going on, but they'll look for a reason to stop the person. You know, but at the end of the day, the person's violating some law, right? Whether it's speeding, lane change, and so forth. But that's where the issue comes in, is that sometimes officers will take this hunch and they'll think that it's actually reasonable suspicion. When it when it's not, it's just a hunch. It's unparticularized. It's just like, hey, this guy has been cruising around this neighborhood for 15 minutes. You know, he, I think he's up to something. Maybe he's casing or looking for something to steal. But the, the cop doesn't have any specific reason to believe that. It's just something that he thinks is going on. He'll stop him for speeding, then gets him to the car, and he starts conducting a a prowling investigation or or he thinks that there's maybe drugs involved, a drug investigation. I think the officers need to realize that pretext is one thing and scope is another. If that makes sense? Meaning okay. the scope of the traffic stop is the mission of why you stop that person. So I like to tell my officers, hey, look, when you get a lot of experience you know, like you had and I had, you get a pretty good sense of you know people's character. You, you really do. I, I like to say cops are some of the best character meters on, on earth. And they get a sense of character. Like, hey, this female, this guy, maybe he's not up to anything good. But you got to recognize that just because you think that there's something off, if you don't have reasonable suspicion, stay within the focus of the traffic stop. I also think that, uh, just as a side note, I think that states that are legalizing, decriminalizing marijuana, that makes things a little difficult. Cops are not, you know, right now in states like Florida, Texas, if you smell the odor of raw marijuana, you can search the car. When those states eventually become legal, and marijuana is legal for adults to have, cops sometimes don't understand the rules now. They think that they can verify how much marijuana is in the car and so forth. But things like that. I would just say scope issues. This is getting away from traffic stop, just overall police work. Can you explain the concept of good faith in policing and its significance during encounters? There are two doctrines in law enforcement that are highly misunderstood and confused. And one's good faith, and the other one's this inevitable discovery doctrine. That's for another day. But let me just tell you, the problem, good faith is a doctrine that has basically holds that if a police officer does something and they're basically told to do it and they do it and they end up being wrong, they shouldn't be penalized for that. OK, so what I mean by that is the classic example is an arrest warrant that is uh, invalid. The judge is asked to sign a warrant at two o'clock in the morning. Right. Judge, I have probable cause that there's drugs in this house. Can you sign this warrant? And the judge is like man, you really woke me up from a dead sleep, you know? And he signs the affidavit and not the warrant. Well, that's going to be procedurally incorrect, right? The, 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 the search warrant is the top sheet. That needs the judge's signature. So the cops don't realize it. They don't, re- you know, they don't pick up on it that the judge signed the wrong piece of paper. They hit the house, they get all these drugs, and then they want it either suppressed or the homeowner wants to sue. And he says, I want some, I want some coin because, you know, you didn't have a valid search warrant. Do you think that the officers, you know, should pay a price on that? No. Scott, you would agree that they had good faith, right? They they thought they had a valid warrant. The judge did sign it. He, he intended he intended to sign it. The problem though, Scott, the reason I think it's an interesting topic that you brought up is because a lot of officers, okay, they sincerely think that if they are going to be sued for, viol- uh, uh, you know, allegedly violating some of these civil rights, that if they sincerely thought that they were doing the right thing, that they should not be successfully sued. That is absolutely incorrect. The way that the Supreme Court has put it is that when it comes to warrantless searches and seizures, it's not what you believe in your brain, right? Your heart, I should say. It's what you did. Was it objectively reasonable? Can I, let me give you a quick example. If you search the internet for cops search backyard for, for AirPods, 
you will see a video of where cops are talking to a victim that tracked her, I think her, but her uh, AirPods to this backyard, okay, through, you know, find my, you know, iPhone. And the cops knock on the front door, nobody answers. They then go into the backyard to search for those AirPods. That is a clear violation. And based on those facts, right, Scott, that's a clear violation of the U.S. Constitution because you cannot enter the curtilage of somebody's home without their consent, without some kind of exigency or a warrant. Now, the reason I bring up that case is because it, they didn't find the AirPods, but they looked around and they just left, right? But the homeowner found it all on video, right? That's why we've seen the internet. If the homeowner sued those officers for those very simple facts, it is my view that those officers are going to pay money. Now, is that a million dollar lawsuit? Is that a free Ferrari? No, it might be a, a, a Nissan Sentra. But the point is, is that if you saw the video and you talked to the officers, you can probably predict that these officers are going to say something like, well, I didn't I, I didn't think we were violating the rights. I mean, the guy allegedly has stolen property back. They're just trying to recover for this victim and just call it a day and whatever it is. Right. They're not going to think of it in terms of I just violated somebody's rights. They probably thought they were doing the right thing. But that's not what the, that's they call it good faith. But it's not good faith. It's objective reasonless. Objectively, it was not reasonable to enter the, uh, the backyard of those facts. And so. I just want officers to understand that in 2024 and beyond, whenever they're watching this, they got to get it right. You know, in fact, our motto at Blue to Gold is get it right every time. And, and that's why we say that, because it's not what, you know, of course you have good faith. You don't, you're not looking to violate people's rights, but you just got to get it right. You got to know what the law is. You were a police officer. You made mistakes. I know you did. Everybody does. You, you know, and, you know, even lawyers would make mistakes. And even my DAs, if I put a badge and a gun on them, they would make a mistake. But unfortunately, the standards are very high. You got to get it right. You mentioned cartilage. So that brought a question to my mind. And just to set the record straight as best we can for this, inter for the sake of this interview and to whoever who's watching, when it comes to domestics, there's a lot of factors regarding officer safety, but I don't want an officer to violate anyone's constitutional rights out of safety. Right. So right. When it comes to say someone is belligerent out in the front yard and then all of a sudden they insist on going back inside, they go back inside. Can the officer follow them for safety purposes into the house? Okay. You actually bring up a good point. So let's talk about domestics. Now, first of all, when you talk about entering the house or curtilage, and if you don't mind, I like to define that for your audience, because there are definitely going to be some people, you probably get a lot of civilians that watch this too, because they're interested in police work. Right. 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 A lot of people are not going to know what that word even means. But when it comes to, you know, domestics and going into the house and so forth, there is no domestic violence exception under the Fourth Amendment. It's it's actually called the emergency aid doctrine. In other words, you're going in there to protect people. You're going in there to prevent harm, you know, further harm or, you know, imminent harm and so forth. But before I, I, I guess I dive into this, let me just talk about what curtilage is, right? So curtilage is that area around a home. And the Supreme Court, in a case called Florida versus Hardinas, they said that, uh, you know, that area around the home is protected like the home itself. So in some ways, and they didn't say the same as a home, but they said like a home. In some ways, being in the backyard is almost like being in the man's kitchen, right? It, but what is that word? You know, the word curlage is not conceptual, right? A lot of officers know, you know, like if you go to the academy, you know what plain view, like you conceptually plain view and plain feel and, you know. It's the area around your house. Now, typically that includes like backyards and gardens and, you know, and the, the, the porch area and so forth. Now, the answer, your, so that's that's why we're talking about this. Now, to answer your question, if the guy, if, if we're at a domestic and the guy, you know, is uh, he comes, he's outside the home, he sees the cops and he just, you know, goes into the house. Can the police follow him in? Well, the, the next question is, is there a level, is there something urgent, right? Is there, is there articulable facts where the officer can say, if I don't go in right now, something bad happens. Somebody's going to get hurt. I'm going to lose evidence. Uh, the guy, I have, I have probable cause for him. He's going to escape. So imagine an example where the female is the victim, okay? And she's at 7-Eleven, and she has bruises on her face, and she's telling you a story that's consistent. In other words, it's believable. Um, it doesn't seem fabricated. Maybe there's even a history of violence. And, you know, and the, and the thing is, you believe you're like, okay, I have the cop says I have probable cause for this guy. He, you know, he, he batters up, but you don't know for sure. Right. He, the, the, the husband could be the victim, but let's just say, oh, let's say even say, she, look, let's make it a clear case. Let's say she has on video. Okay. So anyway, so she has like the, 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 the inside camera and it shows the video of him punching her. So then the cops go to the house. He's on his porch, you know, smoking a cigarette. Um, you know, obviously wealthy because cigarettes are expensive. And he sees the cops and goes into his house. Can the cops follow him in there 
and make the arrest, whatever? And the answer is no. Not with those facts, because there is no agency. The victims at 7-Eleven, uh, I didn't say anything about kids in the house. I didn't say anything about him having a firearm. All we have is is um, is, a, is probable cause for domestic. But hold on, Anthony, um, not my state. My state, I can absolutely go arrest him, uh, you know, for example, in Georgia. I say, why? What makes Georgia so different? Oh, because, Anthony, it's a mandatory arrest here. And we actually have a law in the books that says, you know, once after we've announced ourselves, we can enter to make that arrest. And I say the way you're interpreting that, the way you're talking like that violates the Fourth Amendment. It may seem consistent with uh, Georgia law, for example, but it violates the Fourth Amendment in the, in the Supreme Court in a case called Peyton, 1984, I think, has made it very clear that you cannot enter a home with probable cause alone, even for a murder. You would have, you would, you would have to have some agency. I'm glad we're having this discussion and you brought up uh... – how the officers say in Georgia will try to say, well, we have this law and they'll uh, argue for articulation of why they did what they did. And so can we, can we kind of shift gears towards that? What's your advice you have for officers to articulate on their reports, testimony, stuff like that? Nah, I'm glad you brought it up because you know, the thing is the, the reality is that report writing is not the sexiest topic in law enforcement. Okay. If I have, you know, if there's two classes on the same day and these are like open credit, like the cop can like, go to this classroom or go to that classroom. Either way, he, he gets credit. And the first classroom is report writing for, for dummies, you know, report writing, you know, 101, you know, and the next one is how to kick in doors and, and, and not break your foot. Like what classroom are cops going to want to go into, right? You know, they love the running and gunning, right? They love the, the suits. And it just, it just, look, cops are wired for speed. They, they like action, right? And that there's nothing wrong with that, by the way. That's a a uh, characteristic of a officer who has, you know, courage and and so forth. But what is going to save their ass in court? Okay, it's not their tactical skills. It's not their kung fu fighting, their ground fighting. It's their ability to articulate. And I will tell you, Scott, we have a major pandemic in our beloved profession. Okay, and that pandemic is a lack of articulation. We have officers. Okay, time and time again, doing the right thing. Their intuition gets into the right place. They are going into the right homes without warrants. They are handcuffing and searching the right people, whatever. And But it's not good faith that's going to save them. We already talked about that. It's their ability to convince a court, a neutral and detached fact finder, i.e. the judge, and convince him or her that they did the right thing on that date. But when they go to the station house, they don't articulate that much. And I'll tell you, when I ask them, like, why aren't you articulating more, you know? They'll say things like, Anthony, look, I'm a, a, a nosebleed badge number. You know, I've only been on a job for three months. Uh, I don't know. I, I, I mean, I, I, the academy was good, but it wasn't great. I didn't, I, I didn't retain everything. I, I, I'm still learning. That's okay. Um, we can work with that, right? The next one would be, um, Anthony, look, I got a sergeant on my ass. We're stressed here. We don't got the numbers we need. The calls are stacking. I got a three striper just saying, get out to the road and, you know, just, you know, get that report done. And just the, the nature of the beast. I said, okay, I, I, I understand that. It's not an excuse, but I understand that. And the last one kind of flavor of uh, answers, I guess, that the, the cop is like, look, I got two months before retirement. I don't care. So the point is, I can work with the first two, but I can't work with the last one. And here's my, but turning, so that's our, our problem. We have a major issue with report writing, but let me tell you the solution. I do have a, a class called Bulletproof Report Writing. It's, it's unlike any other any other course, uh, maybe somebody's caught up to me, but most report writing classes, Scott, are basically nothing more than English one-on-one classes. You, you know what I'm talking about? Like you go in there and uh, you sit down and the, 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 the teachers usually like a college professor type mentality. They talk about misspelled words and they talk about grammar and, and you know, semicolons. And I'm like, this is a not a waste of time, but it's almost a waste of time because we're not you know, it's it's a cool, you get the right profession, but we're not losing cases, okay? We're not getting cops successfully sued. We're not getting cops fired from their job because they don't know where to put a comma, okay? Or they don't know how to spell lieutenant. Do you know how to spell lieutenant, Scott? No, yeah. no, no, no. I, I always had to put mm -hmm. LT. Me too. I, I, in fact, I was in Albuquerque the other day teaching. I don't even know how to spell Albuquerque. Do you know how to spell Albuquerque? Do you, you're, you're smarter than I am. I don't. I'm, I'm, I'm being actually kind of serious here. The point is, we're not losing these cases because we don't know all the rules of grammar and, you know, a plural possessive. We're losing cases because cops do the right thing the vast majority of the time. They do mess up every once in a while. They do the right thing, but they just don't know how to articulate. So let me just give you 
um, what I think is like the key, in essence, what my what my report writing class is about. The way we fix this is number one is we teach them the most powerful word in a police report. And I would like to put you on this, you know, the, the the hot seat here and see if you can guess it. But it's the word because. Okay, let me just give you a great example. Okay. Cops have cop talk. You know, cops cops have a, a, a language and every profession does, right? Doctors do, lawyers do. And so they'll say things like, he appeared to be deceptive. The driver was nervous. I saw the passenger engage in furtive movements. Have you heard cops talk like that? Yeah, of course, right? But is that worth anything? Because I got to tell you, Scott, I've been around police officers my whole life, okay? And I'm not a criminal, okay? And um, But if I was pulled over, I'd be a little nervous. Wouldn't you be a little nervous? Because I, yeah. I don't want to be on the receiving end of traffic stops. Also, I have guns in my car. I, I love guns, by the way. And I don't want to be thinking that this officer thinks I'm kind of weird because they got four guns in the car. I, I'm closer to the Canadian border, so I'm worried about them, you know, breaking off and coming, invading. The point is when a cop pulls somebody over and says, hey, man, like, let's say you're doing a ride along. They're like, hey, man, this guy's nervous. You know what they mean, don't you? You know that that cop is not talking about me and you, you know, nervousness, a little nervous, like, oh, you know, sorry, I'm speeding. They're talking about people that are shaking and fumbling and stuttering and crying and veins popping out their neck. That is pretty extreme for a minor traffic violation, especially when the cop says, if everything checks out, you're going to be leaving here today with just a ticket or a warning, right? So the other one is like furtive movements. They'll say this all the time. I, I saw the, the pastor engage in furtive movements. We know what a furtive movement is. A furtive movement is when a person attempts to hide something or conceal something upon observing police. That's kind of what a furtive movement means, right? You're, you're, tr- you're, you're, being, dis- you're being sneaky, you know? It's worth something, but you know who does not speak cop? is your DAs. <laughs> they try to speak cop, but they don't know the full language, and the, especially the judges. They think a furtive movement is what people do in their bedroom. You know what I'm saying? So we have to define what we mean. We say things, the driver was abnormally nervous because. I thought the person was armed and dangerous because. Now, obviously, the word because is, is just a placeholder just for the idea that you've got to articulate what you're doing out there. If your you know, listeners and, and so forth um, can just take that one piece of information. If they're a police officer, just be like, yeah, okay, I, I see what Anthony's saying. Articulate, right? The next thing I got to tell them is that they need to really be a, tra- a trained observer. That's what cops are. Cops are trained observers. But you really, um, I have a book called the RS PC Pot Guide. RS stands for Reasonable Suspicion, PC Probable Cause. And what it is, it's a, it's kind of a hodgepodge of various things that officers may be able to articulate in a report. So, um, for example, I talk about like, you know, an easy one would be uh, DUI, right? So you have an officer who's, you know, fresh out of the academy, you know, or maybe t- 20 years out of the academy, but doesn't do a lot of DUIs, for example. My book will have a DUI section and it'll say, hey, these are all the factors that can help you prove the elements of DUI, right? If you're looking to prove that he's in, he or she is intoxicated, these are some factors. If you're looking to prove that the person was behind the wheel, of the accident before you arrive, they're outside the car. These are things that you can prove, right? But they need to they need to be a trained observer. Uh, you ever watch the movie Jason Bourne? Yeah. Is that the best movie you've one of the best movies you've ever seen? Oh, one of the best action ones. And I got to see the live action play at, at Universal Studios. So yeah. Anyway. So so, so yeah, you're 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 like a, a, a an official fan, right? I am a huge right. Jason Bourne fan because everybody wants to be like Jason Bourne. Okay. Jason Bourne is a trained observer. You know, he's in the coffee shop. He's walking down the street or in the mall and he's seen the assassins through the uh, these moving you know silhouettes and so forth. And the point is, that's what cops are kind of like trying to be like. They're trying to be like Jason Bourne. So the, if they if they don't see it, they can't articulate it. Right. But oftentimes when you look at these cases and you're like the, the cop is like, I don't think we have it, Anthony. I think we're just too thin or like my sergeants or my lieutenants like Anthony, I think this case is a bust. They should have made the arrest. All right. I said, all right, pull up the video. And I said, all right, what about that? What about that factor? What about the fact that when uh, you ask them if there were any drugs in the car, he said there shouldn't be. That's an odd thing to say. Well, guilty people talk like that, right? And so that's the second thing. So the first thing is the word because. Articulate why you think something. The second thing is you can't articulate what you don't know or you don't see. And the final one is, to me, this is like gold here, right? Don't forget your burden of proof. Cops are indoctrinated. And, and I use that word purposely. Indoctrinated in probable cause, Okay. When they went to the academy, they talked about, you know, beyond reasonable doubt, you know, criminal procedure. 
But when it came to their scenarios, when it came to the report writing, when it came to the officer going on FTO and learning from a senior, a seasoned officer, when they were asking this officer, hey, why are you pulling them over? Why are you know, what, what are your charges? Right. They always use the what, you know, probable cause. What is your probable cause? Did you have probable cause? Hey, yeah, you look, you're, you're still missing probable cause in this charge. Do they ever really say, hey, um, officer, where is the beyond the reason that evidence here? They don't, they don't talk like that. And I don't think they w- they want they should talk like that. It's just that they don't. I don't need officers to talk like that. I need them to think like that. In other words, when an officer submits a police report and it has probable cause for whatever crime it is in there, I can assure you that that is not enough, right? That is not going to get a conviction. There should be nobody in a state prison that was convicted on probable cause. If they were, it's an unjust conviction. So when they write that report, I need them to say, hey, you know, just theoretically, at least rhetorically, ask themselves, do I have enough evidence to prove this case beyond a reasonable doubt? And if the answer is no, what should happen to that case? It should get dismissed, right? We're not looking to waste any time. Why should a person be dragged through a public trial, an, exp- an expensive trial with only probable cause? You would not want to be dragged through a public trial on just on probable cause. You would want the government to have what they think is beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, some of these cops out there are like, but Anthony, you know, sometimes I don't have beyond reasonable doubt. I, all I have is probable cause, but Anthony, I still have to make that arrest because the state requires it. Uh, Scott, have you ever arrested anybody for domestic violence? You did, yeah. Have you ever arrested anybody where you thought that the case would probably be dismissed because the evidence was too weak to get a conviction? A he said, she said, a pushing match? I mean, I oh, have. If it, was a, if it was a he said, she said, I was always go take out a warrant on your own. I, I couldn't arrest based on that. Look, I know what you're saying. If you didn't, if you had something below probable, you know, you like let the judge for, or let the, the judge see if they have probable cause. But let's say, look, you know, I'm in Las Vegas. Let's say the, the wife, for example, saying, hey, he's mad because, uh, you know, uh, he, he came home drunk and he thinks I'm cheating on him. And he pushed me on the bed and, uh, you know, grabbed my phone from my hand. Right. And I believe her, but there's no marks on her. Then after, you know, but I, but I believe her. And he, he's not being very cooperative. He's like saying, well, something happened, but that's not quite what happened. But all right, tell me what happened. I can't, I'm not going to tell you. I said, all right, well, look, I have probable cause, right? We, 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 you know, we do, the law says that you basically presume a victim as being truthful, right? Unless you have evidence otherwise. So I say to the, I say to the guy, hey, I'm, uh, you're going to jail tonight. And right when I put hooks on him, the wife is like, no, 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 no. That's not what I wanted. I just wanted you to teach him a lesson for tonight to not put hands on me. I say, look, he's still going to jail. I have to make this arrest. And she says, well, I'm not going to court. Probably what's going to happen, Scott, in that case, and it's sad, but um, most jurisdictions are probably just going to say, look, there's just not, if we don't have a cooperating victim, we're probably, and we don't have like ironclad proof, like the, the case is probably going to be dropped, right? But did the cops do good work that day? A, it's a mandatory arrest, but also did, did that arrest probably solve a problem for the night? Did it teach the husband to not lay hands on his wife? And, you know, if you do that again, you know, it, you know, it just gets more serious. The point is, is that even if the cops don't have a beyond a reasonable case, it doesn't mean we shouldn't make the arrest. It just means that realistically, especially in big jurisdictions like LA, New York, Dallas, and so forth, it's not going to get tried because they, just don't, they need a case that's turnkey. So that's the three things. Then I'm telling you, like these three things fix most reports. Think about because the, a cop, if you're thinking something that's important, don't just say it. You got to prove it. Be aware of, of evidence. You know, try to make those observations. And, you know, your burden of proof is beyond a reasonable doubt. It's not probable cause. Probable cause only gets you an arrest or gets you a search warrant. When I worked in law enforcement, nobody taught the message you just said about thinking about the burden of proof. I mean, I was always taught and I acted upon <laughs> You need to get as much as you can evidence wise and articulate what mm-hmm. you have. And you need to be able to sure. write this up so you can explain it to a jury based on the probable cause and evidence you have. But but uh, yeah, that's a good way to put it. Just you have to be thinking about uh, proving that beyond a reasonable doubt. So I'm glad you brought that yeah. up. And, and, and if I just made one more point, you know, if you ask officers, hey, uh, who's in charge of finding enough evidence for beyond a reasonable doubt? They almost not overwhelmingly, but many officers think that it's the DA. It's the prosecutor. No, it's us. They deliver that case on behalf of the good people of your state, right. but they don't find evidence. Not yeah, not usually. It, yeah. yeah, no, I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, I would never want an officer to go into it thinking it's a DA's job. No, you're the mm-hmm. the cops are the ones on scene. You have to collect all the evidence for your case. Correct. Oh, gosh, yeah. DAs don't yeah, collect 100%. evidence. That's right. That's right. It, it, yeah, no, 100%. Um, 
All right. Well, you you, were, you mentioned the pandemic earlier of officers not being able to <laughs> articulate, particularly in court. All right. Mm -hmm. I'm seeing a pandemic over the last few years over the Internet. Uh, I think it's getting a little bit better, but ooh, there's still a lot of auditors that are getting under police officers mm. skin. And it's not looking good on YouTube and other social media platforms for the police. So any advice you have for officers who encounter First Amendment auditors to which let me say this first I, I am all for police accountability i'm all for auditors expressing their first amendment but then there yeah but then there's like the first amendment agitators and they they talk yes. to officers the way they wouldn't even talk to their own family ever oh definitely but, uh, right it, it doesn't matter an officer can't take it personal either way so in addition to that what legal advice do you give to police when it comes to these auditors yeah well, look and I, I totally agree with you there's two types of auditors there's the good faith ones good faith that just are trying to make sure the government is doing what they're supposed to. I'm cool with that. I want my government to do what it's supposed to. Maybe we need more auditors, you know, at the federal level. <laughs> and there's those agitators, okay? Here's the thing. 10 years ago, you had a lot of officers really making an ass of themselves and, and embarrassing their beloved agency, tarnishing the badge because they were acting a fool and getting so worked up because somebody's recording them. But yet we record everybody, cameras on our car and our, you know. So, but when, when the camera's turned on us, we get a little uh, frazzled. One of the reasons I think cops don't like cameras pointed at them, they get uneasy about it, is because they don't like to be under a microscope. It's like officers will charge people with crimes and murder and rape and everything, and they do it calm, cool, collected. But once you turn the camera onto them, and you're like, tell us, yeah, you know, you have a rude and discourteous complaint. Like you're an IA and you're getting accused of rude and discourteous. The cops get frazzled. It's true. It's like they just don't they don't like to be under, you know, and nobody does. But the point is, is that let me give you some legal advice. Number one is you should really appreciate the First Amendment. You should appreciate that. And by the way, it is absolutely without a doubt under attack in this great country and, you know, and, and a lot of countries, right? But look at what's happening in Great Britain and so forth. People are literally getting arrested for expressing their opinion. I think the first thing is just have the right mindset. Like we live in a great country that you can have different views and, you know, you may not agree with those views. I certainly disagree with a lot of people's opinions out there, but I'm so glad that they're able to express them because I want to express my mind too. Because I assure you, they also think the same thing about my opinion. The second thing is, and I'm ready for this. I got to, man, Scott, you called the right guy because I got a piece of pro advice for you that will fix a lot of these issues. You ready? You, you sitting down? Focus on conduct, not content. That will fix most of these issues. Don't focus on what they say. Focus on how they act, okay? For example, there is a misunderstanding out there that if a person is taking away your focus, that is obstruction, right? Which is not. That's not in and of itself obstruction. If that was the case, then every gang member near your traffic stop is taking away your focus and they're, they can be arrested. But, but you know, when you have this first person agitator, right? You know, the, the person just recording, most cops are probably going to realize, you know, just leave that person alone. But it's the agitator. It's the person who's calling the officer a pig and a bootlicker and all these Nazi stuff. And it, it sucks. It sucks that that person has that character where they want to call, you know, accuse another human being of being something that they're not without even knowing this person. However, look at the conduct. Are they doing something that violates the law? Are they so close to your traffic stop that it is a legitimate safety issue? Are they getting in between you and your suspects and your witnesses? The fact that they're just ever their, their voice is elevated and they're talking loud and you can hear them and your driver can hear them, for example, in a traffic stop. That's not obstruction. And, you know, I don't think in any state, quite frankly, push them to show. That's just not enough. Take away your focus not enough. So focus on that conduct. What are you going to charge them with if you are going to go after them? Let me also give you another piece of advice for your for your audience. Probably just leave these guys alone, because if you engage them, you open up the door looking like a fool. These first amendment auditors, quite frankly, are very well trained. A lot of them know the law. They that's also why they irritate cops, because they they'll talk about, well, you know, in U.S. versus Johnson, 1992, the, the Supreme Court of Wyoming said I can do this, you know, and the cop does not know what the hell he's even talking about. And maybe the, the, the whole case name is made up. But usually these auditors. They go onto the internet and they learn the rules of the game and they, you know, and they, they make the cop look like a fool because they're not going to like, even like these, uh, these auditors know the statute better than the cops, right? They'll talk about a particular, and uh, a particular statute that applies to the situation and blah, blah, blah. The other thing is a little pro tip is don't fall for the whole, you know, you could be a terrorist thing. You know, how many times have we seen uh, a person recording a police station? 
recording a soft target, you know, like a a water treatment plant, a stadium, but the the auditor is in a lawful place. They're on the sidewalk. Yeah, they're doing weird things like, you know, holding their phone up high to like look, you know, behind the fence and, and this and that. But still, it's still probably lawful. It's, you know, if you don't like it, make a higher fence. What I have, though, is I have these cops. They start playing the whole game of you could be a terrorist. You could be, you know, profiling these targets for an attack. I was like, let's cut the bullshit, okay? Yes, it is possible that the terrorist is playing the role of a first one auditor, and that's how they want to blend into the, you know, most 99.99% of these, these really bad dudes do not want to be calling attention to themselves, making a scene, and, 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 and like a first one auditor. These first one auditors, they scream, contact me, please stop me, please arrest me, because they want to get, they want to get three things, money, badges and fame right they want all three if they can get it but they'll take one or the other and they'll be happy right money badges or fame i need officers to kind of like slow down a little bit and just and, and just realize that this hyper vigilant stuff works against you of like yeah them recording my our vehicles in the back of the police parking lot is a threat to our safety well if you really are that concerned for your safety then take an uber or park your car backed in so they can't read your plate from from the street the point is this extreme hypervigilance that causes officers to overreact when they have somebody who's acting suspicious. And by the way, they want to act suspicious. They want to push that line up to the point where they're not, you know, just right before violating the law, right? Because like trespassing and so forth, but they want to look suspicious. They want to be contacted. They want money, badges, and things. So respect the right, focus on conduct, not content of what their speech, who cares what they're saying for the most part, unless they're saying fighting words, which is rare, and then also don't think that there was a terrorist. If someone's watching right now and they're aspiring to get into law enforcement or new to law enforcement, I'm sure they're thinking, well, there's no way I'm in charge of training in my department. How can we bring in blue to gold? Look, you, you have a YouTube channel, uh, course available online, stuff like that. So yeah. just please enlighten us as, or enlighten officers as to how they can take advantage of blue to gold resource uh, that is out there. Blue to gold is the largest legal trainers in, in the nation. Like nobody trains more cops and legal stuff than us. We do agency wide training where we, we give everybody this advanced class. And it's like, it's very intense. It's high speed, low drag. And, you know, really give these people, uh, the officers a foundation. But the final thing is there is no way in my mind that you can really make good case law, that you can really understand what the fourth amendment is looking for search and seizure wise by one and done, right? Um, it doesn't work in any other, you know, complicated topic like use of force and, and and CIT and so forth. Officers need constant training. And so one thing that Blue to Gold does is we do a lot of stuff for free. I mean, you can actually you can actually become pretty proficient in, in search and seizure by not spending a dime. And what we do is almost every single week, we do a free web- webinar. I don't know if you've heard of these, but we do them on usually on Wednesday nights, we have a YouTube channel with, uh, with over a thousand videos on there. Um, our videos are played in a lot of roll calls. We also have a book, a search and seizure book for practically every single state in the nation. With those materials, I think Blue to Gold is a great resource, not the only resource, but I would say that we're the best resource out there for cops learning search and seizure.